number 172. confess that it's difficult to know where to start as we begin to study from Acts. <coughs> Fear not that I'm going to start in a different book before I start in Acts this morning. But the writer of Acts is a man that we know dearly by the name of Luke. Luke wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I want us to remember that as we study God's Word, that God chose to use human vessels that were divinely superintended. That is, that the Holy Spirit oversaw and inspired the work of men to write down the history that we have recorded for us in God's Word. When we say inspired, we do not mean that was an inspired thought that Kevin had. We use that word in a very loose, non-divine way, but the word inspired in Scripture means God breathed. And so as Luke, as Mark, as John wrote, we believe that the only way that these words could have come to such a full and accurate description of the events that took place in the first century is that the divine was behind it. These men claimed to be writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And we have the vantage point of looking back and saying, there are no contradictions. There is amazing simplicity about what they wrote and how they wrote it. And we have proof upon proof that these words that were written were more than just Wow, that's a great message. But these are words that were inspired by God. As we say that, we want to remember that these were real men writing in a very real time who took very seriously what they were writing and had a very methodical and strategic approach to what they said and how they said it. They did not go about their work casually. Luke gives us insight to this when he writes in Luke chapter 1, describing how he went about writing down his account of the life of Jesus. In Luke chapter 1, Beginning in verse 1, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, stop for a moment and realize that Luke himself did not witness everything that he wrote about, but that he had things delivered to him who were eyewitnesses from the beginning. Luke himself was an eyewitness to many things, but he was not an eyewitness to everything. Does that disqualify him from writing a history of the events that happened? Absolutely not. This is why it says in verse 3, It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Apologies to Bill and Ted's excellent adventure and those of you that have watched it, but most excellent is not a hippie term for referring to your good friend. Most excellent allows us the understanding that Theophilus was a man of means. 
He was wealthy. He was nobility. And his name, Theophilus, lets us know that he was not a Jew, but that he was of a Gentile culture. And the name Theo, meaning God, Phileo, Phileus, meaning lover, he was one who loved God. Some might even say that he had another name, but this was his sort of writing name that Luke attributed to him. I don't know whether or not that is accurate, but I know that his name means lover of God, and that in all likelihood he had commissioned Luke to write this account of the life of Jesus. And so he says, I thought it good to write an orderly account. Luke, a physician slash historian, wrote an account of the life of Jesus that in his mind was ordered. And I'm just going to say maybe he had read Mark first since we just studied it. And maybe he had read Mark and thought, I'm going to put one together and I'm going to write a lot of the same things, but there's going to be an order and an organization to it that's very specific. Not that he found anything lacking in Mark, but that he was going to write one that was very unique for the specific audience that he was writing to. Listen to verse 4. Why was he writing to Theophilus? That you may have certainty concerning concerning the things you have been taught. These men had a very specific reason for writing. John would say, when he wrote his gospel account, that he was writing these things so that you might believe in Jesus, the Son of God. John said, I'm not telling you about every miracle that was ever done. Luke says, Theophilus, I'm writing these things to you in orderly accounts so that you might know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. It's interesting, but Luke begins his gospel with talking about even the census of the Roman world and then about the big picture view of Jesus, geographically speaking, he speaks of what happens in the early days of Jesus. He gives a much more lengthy account of the happenings around the birth of Jesus. And then he talks about what happens in Galilee. And then finally in his writings, he comes down and he focuses specifically on Jerusalem. Some have called... Acts and Luke together, the hourglass history of the early church. Luke starts out here and then he works his way into Jerusalem very specifically. And what I want to share with you this morning is that we will see then the outflow of this as we read Acts. I share this with you as a way to understand the background and a bit of the organization of Acts without belaboring the point too much. You open Acts, and in Acts chapter 1, and verse 1, it says, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Now listen, he says what he began. He isn't what? Finished. And Luke isn't finished writing I share with you all that Jesus began to do and teach. Those are in the present tense. And what then is he doing now? Until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. The organization of your New Testament allows us to think that John is in the middle of Luke and Acts. But what we have is volume one and volume two. You have Luke. And he refers to it here as the beginning. He says, in my former book, O Theophilus. So he's again writing to Theophilus. He said, I wrote about everything that was done 
here up until the time Jesus ascended into heaven. And that's what we're going to read about this morning. And as he shares, and we'll get to this a little bit later and talk about it, but I want to share it with you now. Jesus says in verse 8, But you will receive power, and the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is why we call Luke and Acts the hourglass history. Because Acts picks up in Jerusalem and then goes from there to what? Judea, Samaria, and that's what we'll notice. Luke records this history in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 2, we know the day of Pentecost. They're there in the temple in Jerusalem, right? Right there. And then it goes out and we begin to read about things that happen in Judea and Samaria. We read about Philip and his interaction with the Ethiopian eunuch. We read about the interaction with Simon the sorcerer and the Samaritans. And so the gospel begins to do what? Go out like this. And then we read about a man who is known as Saul, who then becomes known as Paul. And what does he do? He takes the gospel to the ends of the earth. And Luke, in his gospel account, begins with a census that derives itself from Rome. And now where do we end up? At the end of Acts with Paul in Rome. And so as we think about Acts and its organizational structure, we just think of an hourglass shape as Luke has started out wide and then comes in narrow to what takes place in Jerusalem. And then Acts picks it up in Jerusalem and then begins to expand the narrative outward. This helps organize our thoughts. But what I want to impress upon us is that Luke's style of writing is organized and it is intentional and it is divinely inspired. This helps me as I enter into the text to understand how I can be a part of the story that was shared by the Holy Spirit. How can I come to a better understanding of God's Word so that I can come to a better understanding of how it transforms my life? That is the question. I am not trying to learn more about Scripture so that I can tell my friends I know more about Scripture. I am trying to study the book of Acts so that I might be transformed through the power of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The name of the book, as you will read it, is the Acts of the Apostles. That is not a name that Luke gave the book. That was a name that traditionally was placed on it. I would argue that it might be the acts of Jesus through the Holy Spirit and the apostles. The way that Paul, or excuse me, the way that Luke shares and picks up this narrative, he's impressing upon us as readers that what is happening in the church in the first century was very much the actions of Jesus, although he was now seated upon the throne, he was now living and acting through the Holy Spirit that he promised to the apostles and then the disciples or the Christians as they were called as they were obedient to the gospel. Luke is demonstrating that Jesus is not far away. Let's read now, beginning in verse 1, and we'll walk through the verses of Scripture that's our intent to study this morning. 
In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Until the day he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. We read this together as a family this week, and Carter noted something that I didn't find in any of the books that I've read about this, and I want to share it with you. He said, 40 days. That sounds like the flood. That sounds like the temptation of Jesus. He said, I guess that's a hyperlink. And, and the dad and me just goes, yes, he's listening. Why 40 days? That was my question. 40 days would be a time of what? It's time of testing. How challenging was that time for the apostles? How challenging was that time for Jesus when he was tempted? How challenging was that time for Noah? I think it links this together with a few other important events in Scripture and reminds us once again that no Bible story is an island. Everything is connected. This is the story of redemption. So over a period of 40 days, it says, he appeared to them speaking about the kingdom of God. There is a lot power-packed into verse 3. First, he presented himself alive. I want to share a few ways of thinking about the truth as it is presented. And there's one, I think, simple way to understand the message that Luke is encouraging us to grasp in these first 11 verses. The, the truth, as it is borne out, is out, it is up, and it is in. First of all, he showed himself with many convincing proofs. The truth was out there. Jesus presented himself, it says, Alive, Not just once, but a multitude of times. And I think it's worthy of note. Many people who are critical of miracles in Scripture will say, this was a time when people were very superstitious. And of course, they believed this myth that Jesus had risen from the dead. I find the exact opposite to be true in Scripture. The ones who should have anticipated this happening were the ones who said, no way, I'm not going to believe the women. They were the ones who said, unless I put my hands in his side, I'm not going to believe. In fact, Jesus himself had to present himself alive to his very closest apostles on several occasions to do what? To convince them, to prove to them that he was in fact what? A lot, by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days. He presented himself a lot. Luke is summarizing this period of time as a period of time when Jesus in his risen form appeared to them. Verse 4 says, and while staying with them, another translation says, and while eating with them, this is a little point to the fact that Jesus was physically risen, but what he was doing while he was with them was speaking to them about the kingdom of God. And this is helpful for understanding The book of Acts. What is the book of Acts about? It is about 
the establishment of the kingdom of God, entrance into the kingdom of God, teaching in the kingdom of God, and we will also say anticipation of the arrival of the kingdom of God. Because there is a not yet and an already aspect to the kingdom of God. At this point, they were awaiting the arrival of the kingdom of God, right? The kingdom of God is where God reigns through Jesus in the hearts and the minds of his faithful followers. And if you die today, you will still be in, do you know what? The kingdom of God. And if you live today and you're a part of the church, you are in the what? Kingdom of God. If you'll go to be with Jesus today, you will be in the what? Kingdom of God where he reigns. And today, if you are in the church, you are in the what? The kingdom of God. And so he was teaching to them about the kingdom of God. And they were going to be there awaiting the arrival of what? The kingdom of God. As we've studied on Wednesday evenings, we'll find again in the book of Acts that in Acts chapter 2, the promise that had been given was now going to be made manifest. And Peter was going to now be preaching entrance into the kingdom of God. A lot could be said. We'll keep moving. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. What's the promise of the Father? Like if that was a quiz this morning and I just started out with that, we might say all sorts of things, right? But the promise of the Father, as it's specifically mentioned here, is... For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Jesus had promised this before. You can reference his visit with them in John. He had specifically promised the Holy Spirit, and that would be the promise of the Father. Notice throughout the book of Acts that we will find the Father... We will find Jesus, we can say the Son, and we will find the Holy Spirit. And in the first six verses, we find that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are intimately involved, working together to bring about what is necessary for the growth of the church, or as it's stated here, the kingdom of God. Some say that this book should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Here we see the Holy Spirit mentioned, and as the promise of the Father, the apostles, as they are being instructed from Jesus here, are promised that in a few days they will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Baptism has to do with immersion. Baptism has to do with a complete overwhelming. And so in a few days, they were going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You might say, what is that going to look like? Great question. We're going to read about what that looks like in Acts chapter 2. We know that whenever it was going to come, they were going to have to wait for it in Jerusalem, and that it was going to be not many days from now, according to verse 6. What I love to see in these verses is that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are working together and the apostles are sitting around wondering what's going to happen next. They get it, but they also what? Don't get it. Have you ever felt like the apostles before? I get it. I know certain things are true, but I also don't get it. I don't understand everything that I'm going through right now. I know, for example, that Peter was now convinced that Jesus was risen. He knew that Jesus had risen from the dead. He was confused about that at first, but now he knew Jesus is risen from the dead. And now, for 40 days, Jesus appears to them alive, and he says these things. And in verse 6, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? 
They got it, and they what? And they didn't get it. And that makes them a little bit like us. We get it, and we don't get it. And that's okay. Do you know what we should operate under? What we do understand. And that's why these men were chosen. They had questions. They had fears and doubts. But they were chosen to follow what they did know. And to be transformed by the teaching that they did understand. And they were not afraid to ask questions as crazy as we think it might seem sometimes. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They were thinking of kingdom as something like the Roman kingdom. They were thinking of kingdom in a purely governmental, earthly sense. Jesus had already explained that his kingdom was not like the kingdoms of the world. Jesus had already explained that in his kingdom, his followers did not fight using spears and swords, but his kingdom was different. Jesus had given his life so that he might reign as king, which is very different than how earthly rulers assume their kingship. Jesus was at no point saying that he was not going to have a kingdom. Jesus was just saying his kingdom was going to be different than their concept of a kingdom. They wanted to know Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? I think it's interesting that he doesn't say no. And I want you to think about this for a second. Here's his answer. It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Jesus, if we open up Acts chapter 2, we will see that the kingdom was going to be preached to Israel first. And so I want us to understand that everything has its order and its sequence. Jesus simply addresses their question by telling them what they needed to do. I find that encouraging. Sometimes we have questions why and when, but we need to be focused on what we need to do. You might say, well, why is this going on in my life? When is this going to stop? When is this going to happen? What time and dates? He said it's not about time and dates. Here's what you need to do, and here's what's going to happen. Very specific. Where's the application for us? School. Work situation. Relationship challenge. When is she going to change? When is he going to do this? When are you going to take this away from me? What? Focus on what you can do. Not on times or dates. There are a lot of religions in our world today that are very focused on times or dates, sequences, and patterns of events. Every hiccup in the Middle East causes a readjustment of an abacus calculation. We are not concerned about what happens politically because what happens in the White House doesn't affect what happens in my house, says the Lord. What happens in my house is that the king rules and the king is seated on his throne. And so I'm going to be in charge 
whether or not earthly rulers pay any attention or heed to what happens in the kingdom of God, says the one who sits on the throne. And so our focus is on what we need to do and what we can do in any and every situation. Sorry that got a little preachy. We'll get back to the text. But I think it's important for us to remember where Jesus sits and what we need to be focused on is what we can control and what we can do. It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by His own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Remember that in this passage, we have seen that the truth of the gospel outwardly manifested in convincing proofs. Now we will see the upward reality of truth in this scripture. An often overlooked event, probably not given enough attention to in my own teaching, is what is said in verse 9. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Daniel chapter 7 talks about the Son of Man coming on the clouds. I believe these men would have recognized that what was taking place was the ascension of Jesus, the Son of Man, to his throne. Roman rulers, emperors, were said to have their disembodied soul upon death become deity among the gods. Jesus, his embodied presence, so far different, proof and evidence that he was alone son of God. It would have been proof, evidence, fact in the ascension of Jesus that he was unique. He was different. He alone ruled. Yet in a culture of people who claim that their emperor went to assume some divine throne as an unembodied spirit, Jesus came back from the dead, proved himself to be alive, and then ascended into the heavens. Here's the question I have for us. How far did he have to go to ascend into heaven? I've always thought of those balloon send-offs, you know. They don't do that anymore. I know it's, it kills a dolphin every time it happens. But... You've seen before when the helium balloons go, right? I used to, as a kid, try to keep my eyes. Just far, far, far. And then somebody said, oh, there they are. And they just go, and they go, and they go. How far did Jesus have to go to get to heaven? You know, I'm asking the question in sort of a hopefully thought-provoking way. Let me ask it like this. How far did Stephen have to see when he saw Jesus? How far away did he have to look? You see, it's not a matter of length. It's a matter of dimension. How far away were the chariots of fire when Elisha's servant was allowed to see them on the hills surrounding the enemies of Israel? The veil was simply taken back. You see, it's not like the balloon. I can't describe to you exactly what it looks like. But heaven isn't a place far away. Heaven is a place where it is different than what we can physically touch and see here. But as he ascended into heaven, the promise is still true. 
Lo, I am with you always. He is with us. It's not a matter of length. It's a matter of dimension. And if that strikes you as uncomfortable because it's different than how you viewed it before, I just ask for you to try it on for size. Because the disciples were empowered by the ascension. It was not as if he went someplace far away to where they said, well, we'll never see from him again. We'll never hear from him again. It just meant now a different age was starting. In order for the Holy Spirit to come in its full manifestation to them, Jesus had to go. Yes, he went. But it wasn't saying that he was somehow now way far away. It was just in a different manner. And isn't that an encouragement to us? Isn't it important for us to remember that in the church today, we have with us the presence of Jesus. And I know in a galaxy of stars, it seems like we are nothing in the grand scheme of things. But in the understanding of Scripture, we are always told that Jesus is beside us and he is with us. And so as he ascended up on a cloud and took him out of their sight, they were gazing into heaven. Where were they gazing? They were gazing upward. Where had he ascended? Into the clouds. But what were they told to do? And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. And he said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. What he's telling them is, now it's time to act. There is a blessing in understanding that Jesus ascended to the throne. The truth is out. The truth is up. And when we understand that Jesus ascended to the throne, we can, at its most basic level, understand and know that he determines what is right and that he advocates for us on a daily basis. Jesus is present with his people. Look at what John saw in Revelation chapter 1. In Revelation chapter 1, just a reminder of the Son of Man. Then I turned in verse 12 to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, from the mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things you have seen, those that are... Those those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Jesus is seated upon the throne. He reigns and he rules as king over his church. He is ascended to the throne and he is intimately involved in the life of his people. We do not want to see Jesus merely as he is often painted or portrayed in popular culture. We must realize 
that his ascension to the throne means that he is interceding for us, he is advocating for us, he is mediating for us, his people, every moment. He is for us. If this world says you're not right, if this world says we don't accept you, remember as you go back to school this week, Jesus is seated on the throne. And it only matters what he says. When you don't know where to turn, don't give up. Turn to the one who's seated on the throne and has all things in control. The truth was demonstrated outwardly. The truth looked up and to the throne we see Jesus seated there. And now I want us to remember. As the apostles would come to know that it is also inside each one of us meant to transform our lives. What was it that these men were going to be waiting for? The presence of the Holy Spirit. How was it that their lives were going to be transformed? These would be men who would be known as temples of the Holy Spirit. Who are we followers of Jesus Christ? As we are in his word, as we are prayerful, as we sing, as we live out God's word, we understand that the spirit comforts, the spirit has convicted, and so the spirit is very much alive and at work in the kingdom of God. Out, up, and in. And so we read in verse 11, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now there's a sense of urgency. Now there's action that needs to take place. Verse 12 is where we'll pick up next week. I hope that as we read through Acts, that we will see the story of the book of Acts is meant to be transformative in the life and the ministry of each one of us. We all have a place and a people where we can serve, where we can share. And the gospel is the truth that is out, that is up, and that is in. And we can see it transforming the lives of these men. It's exciting. It's urgent. And it's active. And we today, as the body of Christ, as the church, as the kingdom of God, can see how these teachings can transform the way that we live. The message that these men would preach in just a few days is those who are going to repent and be baptized for the forgiven for the forgiveness of their sins. That was the invitation that they shared with those who heard the gospel for the very first time. And that is the invitation that we offer this morning in Acts 2 and 38. Those who were cut to the heart, who realized their sin and desired to respond to the teaching of Jesus, were baptized that very day. Quite a few, and we'll talk about just how many in a few weeks. There's one who desires to respond.